Okay, Mr. Most Days Off, now we're ready for the Tee Public ad. Head over to tpublic.com slash bestdarndiddly right now to support our show, get yourself some Best Darn Diddly merchandise, and help grow our podcast. <laughs> I, I uh, messed up there. Can I get another take? Okay, just a second. Out of the way, amateur. Hey, hey, it's Krusty. Go to tpublic.com slash bestdarndiddly. Hey, hey, it's Krusty. Go to patreon.com slash bestdarndiddly. <laughs> Go to popthreads.com and save 15% with the discount code Simpsons. Hey, hey, it's Krusty. Go to bestdarndiddly.com to get all your podcast needs from the greatest show on earth. Learn from a professional, kid. All right, Krusty. We're ready for your take. Krusty? Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. This is a weekly podcast for anyone who loves The Simpsons, or ever has loved The Simpsons, hosted by two dudes that grew up on The Simpsons. My name is Miles, better known as Mr. Most Days Off, and today we have got a hell of a good episode. Hell of good, not just because it's a Treehouse of Horror episode, but we have a most amazing guest joining us today. We've been talking about him a lot coming up into this podcast, and we're going to introduce him to you in just a moment. But first, joining me as always, your co-host with the most, Richie the Whiz Kid. How you doing today, Rich? Thank you for that great introduction. I am a great guest, but I'm here every <laughs> week, so I don't know why you're talking about me so much. We're not going to waste time today, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to throw it back to you, the man, the myth, the dead Willie. It is Miles. <laughs> Three times. <laughs> Our guest today, one of, by his math and my addition, the 14 people, approximately, that created The Simpsons. He went on <laughs> to create The Critic. Now, he's written a book, Springfield Confidential, Joke Secrets and Outright Lies from a Lifetime Working for The Simpsons. And I guess we should mention he's won a few Emmys along the way, too. It is Mike Reese. How are you doing today, Mike? Very good. Hi, great to be here. It is so great to have you here, Mike. Uh, we've been looking forward to this for a long time. Most of our listeners are already going to have a general idea of who you are, but I don't think anybody can quite put your connection to The Simpsons better than you can. So how about you tell everybody that just in case somebody tuned in by mistake, how are you associated with The Simpsons, with the Simpsons Mike? It's called The Simpsons. That's the kind of authenticity <laughs> I can bring to the show. Uh, I am one, I guess I'm one of two writers, just me and Al Jean, who've been at The Simpsons from day one to day 15,000, which we just celebrated. Uh, we've just spent our lives there. I, uh, Al and I were the original, I think we were the original writers hired on the show. Uh, back when nobody wanted the job. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, unlike a, a lot of people, we never, ever left. I can't get another job. So I've been there for 30 years, and I've loved every other day of it. And, <laughs> that's, and Al and I, I should mention, uh, ran the show in seasons three and four, which... The fans, I think, are a little too nice, too, but it's great that they like those shows so much. Well, we actually just recently got the pleasure of reviewing every single episode in both of those seasons, and I don't think it's a case of the fans being too nice at all. That is definitely where exactly it happens is definitely uh, up for the debate, and we'll leave that for the internet, but that is definitely the time where The Simpsons really finds itself and becomes the show that we all know and love now. It was, you know, we were in a real groove, I think. It was at least the first two seasons, we were figuring out the voices, figuring out the characters, learning how to do the animation, and then it was up and running. Then it was sort of, we didn't have to worry about that stuff. Then we could just write the show free and clear. And the other big thing, I guess, in season four, we got lucky because... We had kept our original staff together for three years, and then people started to leave. They started to go away, and we said, oh, we need someone new, and we hired uh, this 22-year-old kid named Conan O'Brien, and that was a good hire. 
Huh, never heard of him. Never heard of him, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and poor Conan, you know, he's been doing his own show now for, I think, 25 years. And people still, and, you know, he's hosted the Emmys and the White House, the presidential, uh, those dinners and the press club dinners. And people still come up to him and they go, are you ever going to go back to The Simpsons? <laughs> well, I mean, his show has only been on the air for 25 years, not like The Simpsons. I mean, you know, he's always going to be living in that shadow. Yeah. <laughs> I think Jub Jub needs a good episode, too. What'd you say? I think the Iguana Jub Jub needs a good episode written for him, too. He, uh, yes. It, you know, I got to say, he rolled in. We were wondering, you know, how is anyone going to adapt to the new show? He was literally our first new hire. And he walked in and took over. He just took over the show. We all just sat back and watched him go. And his first day on the job, he pitched the monorail episode. He was, he was a ball <laughs> of fire. But anyway, this is not about him. This is all about me. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's keep perspective here <laughs> and if you want to hear some more about conan there are some more great stories in the book that you just wrote mike springfield confidential it's a great book it's 20 what 28 29 years in the making now yeah i was just gonna say it's so full of stories was this just the right time were you filling up on them and and they were just spewing out at this point or is it just you're at the point in your career that if it does get you fired you're like fuck it it doesn't matter well, there's a, <laughs> it is all those things and more. Um, the the real trick of it was I got tricked into writing it. I literally, if somebody had come to me and said, "We want you to write a Simpsons memoir," I said I would say, "No way." But you know, why me? I don't feel like writing a memoir. It could get me in trouble. But it was a journalist named Matt Clickstein came to me and he said, "It was two years ago." He said, "He's I've never even met this guy. This shows you." How trusting I am of human nature. He calls me up. <laughs> you and me, we're going to take a road trip all over America. We're going to find Mike Reese's America. That'll be the book. And there won't be any Simpsons in it. Okay? <laughs> it's two years later. The book is coming out. <laughs> it's 100% Simpsons. There was no road trip. I've never been <laughs> this guy. So, uh, and then, on top of it all off, I found out later his whole idea about going on a road trip and finding America was based on a journalist who went on the road with David Foster Wallace. So he not only took the idea, but at the end of the road trip, David Foster Wallace killed himself. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> Man. Um. Uh, well, we're we're actually very fond of Matthew Clickstein. I, I read his uh, book Slimed, and Richie and I got to go see his uh, movie about Mark Summers, which was yes. absolutely fantastic as well. It is very funny, though, to hear that his vision of your road trip, especially after just finishing your book. Uh, yeah, no Simpsons whatsoever. That, that was yes. definitely the vision you achieved. <laughs> yes, I, I love to tease the guy. He... There's, if you read the book, he brought something really great to the book. I wrote it. I don't want anyone thinking I had a ghostwriter or anything like that. I'm perfectly capable of writing a decent book. But what he did is, because he's a great journalist, he interviewed all my colleagues and co-workers. And these are people who don't return my calls. Guys like Tom <laughs> Lovitz and uh, Dan Castellaneta. He called them all and he interviewed them at length. And so... Here I, in the book, I'm telling my version of the story, and every once in a while, he'll drop in these long quotes uh, from the people involved in the story. Guys like, it was, it was Lovitz, Nancy Cartwright, Dan Castellaneta, uh, Al Jean. I got to see what Al Jean says behind my back. So <laughs> I think it's real value added to the book. I very much enjoyed those moments too. It's especially, I mean, even Judd Apatow, like you said, is in there, and it's cool seeing their perspective from when you were young. They were younger. There's something kind of humbling about reading Judd Judd Apatow uh, talk about failing essentially when he when he wrote his first spec script. But of course, uh, it came back around for him all right. I think it did okay, and even his he wrote a spec Simpsons and. A quick 22 years later, we managed to put it on the air. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So 
I want to know just from all of the stories that you've told and all the th- great things that came from the Simpsons side of things. I know, uh, and I know Richie has some questions about this too. You talk a lot about your world travels and all of the different things you get to experience with Simpsons fans around the world. And I know that stood out to both Richie and I as one of the more fascinating things to read. Yes. You know, it was funny when, again, I was so reluctant to write this book and I thought everyone at Simpson would be just going, why you, why are you writing this? And instead they were really encouraging and they were saying, well, you know, you, cause you don't, you're an interesting guy. You, cause I've written uh, 19 children's books and I've been to 114 countries and I've been to both poles and they go, that'll be interesting for, you know, two or three pages. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit of that stuff in the book, too. But what's been really great and has actually informed the book is that uh, for the past 20 years, I've gone all over the world lecturing on The Simpsons. I got this, you know, 90 uh, minute presentation about The Simpsons, telling stories and showing rare animated clips from the show. And it's brought me to 21 countries. I mean, I've done this speech in Qatar and Israel and India twice and Chile. I've, I've been everywhere. And uh, what what was good for the book was uh, because I do these speeches and the best part of the speech is always Q&A where I find out what the fans want to know about the show. And so that's how I put the book together. It was I was able to collate what everyone in the world wants to know about The Simpsons in over 20 years. I've not only got the questions, but I got the answers and I was able to figure out the funny way and sort of the interesting way to give the answers to all the questions everyone wants to know about the show. And so the book has sort of been 20 years in the making, if I can (laughs) give you a line of bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) But it was really what's been sort of nice about the book is in the six months since I turned in the manuscript, uh, Ever since then, when somebody asked me a question about the show, I go, it's in the book. It's in the book. I keep nice. I'm really glad to know, you know, once this book comes out, no one will ever have to talk to me again. No one's one's ever going to have to listen to your podcast. This is we've all signed our death warrants here. Well, it's a good way to go out. So yeah. say you've set up that future for that dream life of being a hermit and just never having to see anyone at all. That's perfect. That's it. It's like <laughs> I have made myself redundant. Uh, this is the book is sort of like going, and you can get the audio book. I, I they let me record the audio book, and that's like going on an eight hour date with me, and and like uh, <laughs> like going on a date with me. Uh, you have to pay. <laughs> No, no going Dutch on this one. That's fantastic. We haven't said it yet. We're not done talking about the book just yet, but you can, in fact, pre-order this book right now. It's going to be available next week on June 12th. And just so Mike doesn't think I'm crazy, we are recording this in advance. So this will be released one week before the book comes out. You can pre-order it and get it delivered to you on June 12th from Amazon.com. And everyone listening right now, do it. Even if you won one of our early copies, it's a book you're going to read so much, you're going to want to have two. It's fine. Go ahead and pre-order at Amazon.com right now. That's Springfield Confidential. Great ad. By the way, I'll just say, not that we need to sell it even more, but uh, the reviews have been fantastic. The reviews are just coming in, but Vanity Fair called it extremely funny and fascinating. And I think Kirkus Reviews said this is something every Simpsons fan is going to love. So, oh, wholeheartedly, absolutely agree with that. That's it. You don't have to just listen to us. Actual strangers like the book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing that you said when you were uh, actually, it was during your promotion for our worst contest ever, which was we are so happy to to work with you on that. But you had talked about how you structured the book like a Simpsons episode, and both yeah. Richie and I agree with that so much. It's so nice to read as a Simpsons fan because you somehow turned something that is very different from a Simpsons script, but it's still, we, we, we read your guys' script every single week when we do this show and oh. it flows so well in that same type of structure Two Simpsons fans. I think they're going to really appreciate. Oh, great. Yeah. I mean, you really learn all the nuts and bolts of the show, which could sound very boring, but 
you know, we're making a, a comedy cartoon. So actually, even the process is very funny, I think. And there are, you know, stories about sitting there at three in the morning trying to get just the right joke. I think they're sort of funny. There's there's literally a story behind every joke. I think anyone who listens to the DVD commentaries gets that, that, you know, the process is kind of fun and funny too. <laughs> I like hearing about your process and your idea behind the, the perfect punchline to every joke as well. And, and all the work that can go into that, but that you always feel there's a, there's a perfect ending to every joke. And I, I really liked that aspect of, of the book. And I liked hearing about all the other writing aspects of the book as well, working on children's books and movies. And, and on top of that, I wanted to know when you are a consultant for a movie, do you know before the movie's being made that you're going to be a consultant or do you just wait for them to call you and tell you their problems? And then you just go into it. Yeah, no, they come to me when they're already in trouble. And it's sort of a good <laughs> You're a lifeline, essentially. <laughs> That's it. I mean, I, I'll never write... This is the deal on animated films. And we'll just give a little of the background because on top of The Simpsons, I've worked on... I've been a contributing writer for two dozen animated movies. So all the Ice Age movies and the Despicable Me's and the Minions and uh, the Lorax and Rango and Robots and Rio. It's... It's a whole lot, of, and then a whole lot of crap, too. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's so hard to write an animated movie because you got to invent the characters and story. you got to invent the whole world. It's just back-breaking work uh, that you really, you don't have enough energy to make it then fun and funny. I mean, they do their best, but it's just too much heavy lifting. So then they come to a guy like me and say, Funny it up, Simpsons it up. And, uh, and so this is very common. Any animated movie you see might have five or six or seven writers pitching in on them. I think uh, it was Shrek, which I did not work on, uh, had something like 42 writers working on Whoa. it. Whoa. So wow. that's the process. I'll, I'll tell the story that's in the book, which uh, I love, which was I was working. I'll even name the movie. I don't think I said it in the uh, book. But I was working on the movie Rio, and it just drove me crazy because I was writing and writing and writing, and they never changed anything. The script always stayed the same. And I would tell them every week, I said, look, you don't have to use my stuff, but you got to use somebody's. And I found out, too, Judd Apatow, his, uh, his wife is the star of Rio, the female lead, and he was working, too. And he called me and said, they're not changing anything. So I kept trying to quit Rio. Every week I call, I said, look, I quit. And they said, no, we need you, Mike. We need Mike Reese in this movie. So I worked on it for three years. And when the movie was almost coming out, I said, well, gee, I've worked for three years. Am I going to get writing credit on the movie? And they said, well, no, we had 19 other writers working at the same time. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And the movie did pretty well, too. So you'd want your name attached to that. Yeah, it came out. It came out fine. It uh, again. I don't think it was the funniest script. The animator, uh, the director, was a guy named Carlo Saldana, who's a brilliant director. Uh, I just know. I know that at least the dialogue could have been a little funnier. And you know, yeah. the director English is not his first language. He's Brazilian, so he knew the Rio stuff. But oh, it was so hard to get a joke in that movie. And then I'll. Uh, just the sequel to the story. The story is a sequel, too. So it was so hard working on Rio that when they said, we're making Rio 2, I said, no way, forget it. I, uh, I don't want to do it. And they said, fine. And they called me three years later. They said, look, the movie's almost finished, and it needs that Mike Reese touch. It's not quite <laughs> there. And nobody's ever said that to me, that Mike Reese touch. I've been arrested for doing the Mike Reese touch. And... Um, uh, yeah. So I said, I'm so, you know, there's been such bad blood, but I'm honored you asked. I don't even want money, which is, again, something that's never been said. <laughs> I said, I'll work on the movie. I said, all I ask is at the end, in the end credits, when you thank 300 people, when you thank Avis rent a car in the state of Georgia and that kind of thing, uh, and Applebee's, can you say, and th thank Mike Reese too? And they called me back the next day and they said, 
No deal. What? <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, I recently reread that part in the book, and I was always wondering what movies they, those were. So I'm really glad to get that that little tease there and, and have the story completed. I know. See, so yeah, I've just I've just killed my career here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like it's gone full circle because you also talk about in the book your time working with Johnny Carson when you'd write for Karnak and how many of those end up on the cutting room floor. I think what did you say? Like 600 jokes get written and only 12 make the air or something in that neighborhood. It was, yeah, 300. You know, with no need to exaggerate. It was <laughs> <laughs> when you would do Karnak, when he would do any of those bits, it would, 300 jokes were submitted. He cut it down, the head writer would cut it down to 18. Johnny would cut that down to 12. And of those 12, four would bomb terribly. <laughs> it was just such a ridiculously bad batting average. There's mm-hmm. a, I won't ruin this story because it's too good and I want people to read it for themselves, but the, the story you tell about that whole s- time in your life, I, I really appreciate with how, you know, certain things bomb more than once, we'll say. <laughs> yeah. It's a good story. Absolutely. There's, I promise, you know, the, the book is 85, 90% Simpsons, but the other 10% is, uh, there are at least good, interesting stories, stories about Johnny Carson and Alf and uh, Gary Shandling and animated movies. They said, they said we don't want to hear about any of your boring jobs. So it's only the stuff that at least has a cult following is in the book. Well, and I know hopefully we'll be able to get you to come back and talk a little bit more about The Critic when we discuss oh. A Star is Burns later in the season. Uh, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but you're you're responsible for that whole character. And the the other thing I was really interested to read about, I looked it up, I, I was unaware of this before this book, and that was your project Queer Duck, which uh, absolutely hilarious shorts that are, uh, they came around from what I understand in the time when the internet wasn't quite what it was today, so you were in the those short animations, we didn't have YouTube in the sense that we have it today, so it wasn't necessarily quite as strong, but this is a series that totally holds up and I think would absolutely crush in the YouTube era. You, people, please look up Queer Duck. They're all on YouTube illegally. There's a, a Queer Duck movie, a <laughs> uh, full-length feature. It's also on YouTube illegally. Uh, but it's it's literally the thing I'm proudest of in my career, even more than The Simpsons, more than The Critic, more than Rio 2. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> wow, it's, that's the holdout I wasn't expecting right there. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, folks. <laughs> it was it was 2000, and yeah, you know this. It was on a a website called Icebox.com, and it was literally ahead of its time because every day <laughs> would post a three minute original cartoon. And this was the days of dial up internet where if you wanted to see a three minute cartoon, you had to leave the computer running all night long to download yeah. it. <laughs> so it was insane. And uh, the company folded within a year, but uh, you know, I think all that stuff is scattered all over YouTube and it, it was pretty great stuff. Even Larry David wrote a cartoon for it. A lot of Simpsons people worked on it. The other thing I'll just mention before we get a Queer Duck. I mean, what made Queer Duck exciting? I just, I said, I want I, I read an article in the year 2000 that said there are no gay people on TV. I mean, now on TV, everybody's gay. But, but I was so shocked. There's no gay people on TV. And so I... I created this cartoon and I'm not gay, you know? And uh, so for the year it it was on and it was really popular all over the world, I had to stay in the closet as a straight man. And uh, (laughs) it was such a funny, weird experience and reporters would come to my house and I had to hide my wedding pictures and I would lock my wife in the bedroom and sometimes I'd forget about her for weeks. (laughs) It was a very interesting part of my life. Is that the premise for the future episode where, where Mo has to pretend to be in the closet as straight? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, you can read all about Queer Duck, The Critic, The Simpsons, of course, and a lot more just insight from Mike's life. That's in Springfield Confidential, 
Joke Secrets and Outright Lies, available in about a week. Pre-order it now on Amazon.com. Wow. Good what? work. And even oh, I'm thank you. Of my own book now, so you've done a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Plug it till you're burnout on it, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. So... What we are all about here at Best on Diddly, however, is coming together as fans of the show and reviewing some of this excellent work that is from our childhood, personally. We grew up on the show. Uh, we're talking about Treehouse of Horror 5 today, the fifth Simpsons Halloween special, as it's listed in the opening credits, which I thought was interesting. This one is... A fantastic one if you are a fan of movie parodies. It has probably one of the most recognizable Treehouse of Horror movie parodies that they've done to date in The Shinning, not to be confused with The Shining, of course. You can't say that. (laughs) Can't say that. that. Don't want to get anybody in trouble. Uh, This one did debut on October 30th, 1994. We got some spooky credits that they love to do, uh, including the gravestones this time. Instead of revisiting some failed television classics that just didn't quite make the cut they just actually put the words amusing tombstones on the (laughs) tombstones we also get our classic adding names making the spooky names to the creators credits including we had a credit for a consulting producer by one mike reptilicus reese along with his writing partner anachronistic al jean Wow. See, we were, it's an amazing show in that we were already out of funny names. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know, you know, I never thought we'd be revisiting these things 25 years later. So uh, Reptilicus, I'm sure it means nothing to anyone. I thought I I put that in because that was my brother and my favorite monster movie when we were kids. And I said, all right, I'll do this for my brother, Steve. We'll get an audience of one, and who will ever talk about it again? And here I am now. here we are. (laughs) (laughs) Nice little Easter egg there 25 years down the road. That's awesome. Yeah. The joke for one now shared by many. Yes, if you call it a joke. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it works. The yeah. couch gag on this one is zombie Simpsons all mi- mix-matched with different members of their family's body parts. They swap heads when they get to the couch and sort of fix it, but there's definitely still a lot off about all of them. And for the very last time, at least until all the way until season 29, we get a warning from yeah. one Marge Simpson saying that this episode might just be a little bit too scary for the viewers at home. And again, this is something that we've become familiar with early on in these seasons, but we will not see this again for another, what, nine, no, 25 years, 24 years? 24 yeah. years, yeah. Yeah, so Mike, is there any insight on that? Is uh, Did you guys just get tired of this Marge gag, or did the episodes get less scary? Like, what, what was the reasoning for this disappearance act? Yeah, well, everything, it's funny, because you could do a show about just the opening credits of that episode. It would be your worst episode ever, but there is a lot to talk about, which is, it is where we're already burning out the form that, you know, we we're not doing the funny tombstones anymore. And uh, we tried. I remember, you know, I only worked a couple of days on this episode. You know, I was a consulting producer at the time I was doing the critic. Uh, but I come back and I'm helping. And we spent like three, four hours trying to come up with the funny tombstones and they were never easy to write and they were never all that funny. And, uh, but this time we're trying to do it and we came up empty. We came up completely empty and, uh, and Dave Merkin said, forget it. And, uh, and I know Al, Al Jean, he fought a little harder just cause he wanted to keep the tradition going, but that was it. Dave Merkin did a tombstone for the tombstone. So <laughs> we didn't do that. I think it's also, the first one without a wraparound story. The other four episodes all had three segments and then a story connecting them all. And this, to, again, Merkin said, forget it. You know, it takes up too much time. It's too hard. You know, there, and, uh, and finally, yeah, we stopped doing the warning. The, the warning goes back, of course, to the first Halloween show. Not everyone knows. You probably have mentioned it on the show. 
It's a parody of the opening of the movie Frankenstein. Did you know that? I do believe we did talk about that on our very first Halloween special on this podcast. Okay, yes. Frankenstein opened with a man coming out on stage in front of a curtain, warning everyone it's a scary movie. And, you know, if you're in the movie theater, what are you going to do? You know, you pay- <laughs> <laughs> you're already out eight bucks or twelve fifty nowadays, whatever it is. Yeah, can you imagine if you went to see uh, went to see a movie and they come out warning you, get out of the theater, you're not going <laughs> to like this. Uh, you know, I wish they had had that, like in Infinity War, the guy comes out, it's an hour too long, get out. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but so, yes, yeah, so we, you know, the first time we did the warning, it was an homage, but it was also legitimate on the first show because we did think it was too scary and it was too weird. You know, The Simpsons, I think it was like episode 15. People are just coming back in the second season to watch their fun, happy show. And here's here's the Simpsons murdering each other. It was, you know, and, you know, there were still little kids watching the show. So we were legitimately worried the first time. Uh, we brought Marge back the second year, did it again just in case. And it was certainly by the third or fourth year we realized, we, you know, you know now, you know, we have a brand here. And nobody, if you're going to get scared by this, you know not to watch it. it. It racks my brain to think that people actually get scared by The Simpsons. But to be fair, the... This one does get a little bit gruesome with Homer, I mean, essentially trying to murder the family and the kids being eaten. And even going back to the earlier ones, I uh, I recall Murder House being one that was particularly, I guess, dark uh, in that that trio of stories. So I guess, but it just, it's The Simpsons. How do you not know what you're going to get? But we're going back to 95 at this point, so I can see it. Yeah. I'll admit, I'll admit that like the the first time I saw the cafeteria one where the the students were being eaten, when I had to like wrap my brain around the fact that the faculty were cannibals, like it disturbed me a little bit the first time I saw it. But I was still going to come back and watch it every time it reran because it's The Simpsons still. But that one, and then the one from the previous season when Ned's head got cut off by the gremlin after he picked it up outside the school bus, those two scenes always got me when I was a kid. I was like, oh my gosh! So yeah. it does happen. I sure remember, you know, you get really scared of things when you're a kid and nobody tells you, no one goes to the trouble of telling you this stuff can happen. And you think, oh, it can happen. (laughs) And uh, so, yes. And, you know, Dave Merkin, who was running the show for this Treehouse Five, um, he put, you know, he's a man who has always pushed the envelope. You know, Al and I, we were running the show. We really wanted to make nice, and, you know, we didn't want to put people off. Dave loves to rattle people's cages, and <laughs> I think it was a year, I'm not, I'm not sure, there was, there were congressional hearings that year about violence on TV, and uh, they were trying to cut back on that kind of thing. So Merkin said, he said, I'm going to make this the nastiest, scariest one uh, we've ever done, and, it, and especially... <laughs> Came through on that cannibal one on section three, where uh, uh, I, I remember I, I was sick. I think I had food poisoning and I missed the day at work. And Al Jean went in and he called me. He said, "He said Merkin's making this really scary." <laughs> <laughs> it's I very much enjoyed this one too, though. Like that, that's the Shining's always a great play, and the time traveling bit is fantastic. Like that's. It seems almost like it, it pays off to go a little bit darker for this one time. Yes. You know, it's a great show. It's a great show. He got away with it. You know, we didn't. Yeah. The show wasn't canceled. As far as I know, there were no complaints. I don't know if we should jump ahead because he's got this cannibal show and it's a little hard to take. And then the ending of that episode <laughs> still <laughs> broke <his teeth. laughs> be traumatic it's it, I, you know bart wakes up it's all been a bad dream and uh which we we'd already done about 12 times on the show <laughs> wakes up, it's a bad dream and homer says no the only thing you have to worry about is the fog that drifts in and turns us all inside out and everyone turns inside out and you damn see you cheap weather stripping 
<laughs> and it's it's so gross and so upsetting. And well, and as they're dancing, you can actually see the bloods like flinging across your screen. And then the bit with Santa's little helper. Oh my god, just it, it is. It's disturbing. It's absolutely disturbing. It is super disturbing. Well, that's Dave Merchant. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we actually talk quite a bit about uh, Dave Merkin and the changes that we we can kind of sense with season five a little bit. And where I see it the most personally doing the show is actually the DVD commentaries because you're you're more predominantly featured on seasons three and four. And season five, it's mostly him and his sense of humor sometimes is so dry that I will admit that I don't know if he's joking or not. <laughs> <laughs> He is even, you know, I've known the guy, I know him before The Simpsons. I worked with him on It's Gary Shandling show. There's nobody funnier. I mean, the guy is just this creature of pure comedy. And, but it can be a little difficult because you try and talk to him and everything that comes out, he'll, you have to go through like six lies and six funny stories before you get to, oh, what's really going on here? <laughs> <laughs> So many jokes. I remember comforting him after his father's death. And even then I had to go through like five jokes from him before we got to it. Yes, it's very sad. No. <laughs> He's a great guy. And I got to say, you know, every showrunner, and I believe there's only seven people who've run The Simpsons in its entire history. There's only been seven people. Uh, everyone brings their own strengths to the show and their own mix of story and jokes and sensibility i think his shows are the funniest seasons uh wow, what a compliment that's it they are just so funny and it was a very interesting time at the show but uh maybe we'll talk about that later <laughs> Ooh. wow well for now we do see marge interrupted by bart simpson taking over the radio transmission i actually really love this because you can see the audio signal as it comes across the screen and when they say the simpsons you actually see the shape of the simpsons family which personal story that's how i know i've been editing too long <laughs> <laughs> moving on from that we see that we are in fact going to have three stories and the first one is going to be the shinning the shinning where we start on monday and it's been a long trip already but we're almost there Except that they forgot to lock the front door. Do oh, do. Oh. <laughs> so we cut to Wednesday, where we've now had two long trips. But it's okay because we're almost there. Oh, except when you lock the front door, they may have forgotten to lock the back door. So we get do do do. <laughs> what I love with Dan about this whole episode is even in the opening bit, you have him making a bunch of random funny noises with, in Bart's transmission. Uh -huh. and, and then you get a bunch of random noises later on, too, in the in the shinning episode. And it's just like it's always he we talk about this a lot, but it seems to do so much with so little where he just completely makes it Homer. And I don't know how long it takes him to do it. I assume he almost can immediately do it even in the earlier seasons. But I I can't get over how great he is at doing random little noises. He's really great at that. And I remember that segment. Now, by the way, just for people who don't know, who people who aren't a hundred years old like me, um, that whole opening with the oscilloscope is from a TV show called The Outer Limits. It's a parody of their opening and the show open. We use the exact dialogue from The Outer Limits. And that's funny because that was a show that scared the crap out of all of us. When we were kids. So, uh, so yes, but so Dan and Nancy Cartwright are making weird noises to make the oscilloscope go weird. And that was the two of them just screwing around. They, there's nothing more fun on the show than a Bart and Homer scene where they're really, they're not antagonistic, where they're having fun together. And those two can just ad lib forever as, as Bart and Homer. <laughs> they're so deep and invested in their characters that you can really just sit back and let them go crazy for a while. That was another thing I absolutely loved reading in your book was when you were discussing how they would sometimes actually be like their characters in the recording booth, just, you know, the Dan, Dan and uh, Nancy goofing off and 
<laughs> Julie getting on to him and yearly saying, oh, we're never going to get done. And it's just so funny to think of this as real life people becoming their Simpsons characters, art imitating life, so to speak. It is weird how they can they can be. I mean, it's one reason they're so great at their characters. I think they are more like their characters than they realize. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we do, in fact, get to the mansion that they were driving to finally, but only after Lisa points out that they left Grandpa back at that gas station. Only no what one seems Grandpa? to mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good joke, too. They just sit, sit in silence. I, I really love those jokes when you guys actually just let the the image hang for a couple of seconds, and it's kind of the joke is, to some extent, that... The, si- the silence is the punchline, I guess I would say. Yes, that was a great technique. We don't, I don't think we do it so much anymore, but in the early years, we used to love doing those long pauses. And, you know, the audience generally got the joke, but there were people who would say, those long pauses mean you couldn't think of a joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can hear Fox execs being like, we're not paying you to be silent. <laughs> <laughs> The Simpsons family arrives at the mansion and they're greeted by Mr. Burns and Mr. Smithers, who are excited that they have the new winter caretakers to look over the house while they're gone for the off season. I thought he was excited about the sea monkeys I ordered have arrived. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I just really love that it's actually all Mr. Burns' fault that all of the terrible things that are about to happen to this family happen when he decides that that they should not have any distractions while they're working. So that means no cable television and no beer. Right. But, but sir, aren't you worried that that might be the reason the last family went crazy and murdered their family? <laughs> <laughs> I love that they're just so casual about the response, too. It's just kind of like, well, tell you what, if we come back and they're all dead, I owe you a Coke. <laughs> <laughs> Dark. Yeah, well, the shinning. I mean, I just I just rewatched the show. One, and it's I I was reading on Wikipedia, which is where I get all my information about The Simpsons. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's it's considered one of the greatest Halloween segments of all time, and part of it is just The Simpsons trick of taking something really good and then Simpsoning Simpsonizing it. So you know, one reason this segment is great is. The Shining is super great and it's super great, full of great visuals and, you know, and, you know, pretentious enough and that you can you can add a lot of comedy to it. It really the holes are there to put the comedy in. So that thing works exceptionally well. And I love, you know, that we uh, we match so many of the beautiful shots from The Shining. So that's a tribute, of course, to Stanley Kubrick. And it's also a tribute to Jim Reardon, who directed that episode. And Jim Reardon would go on to do the movie Wally, and he'd work on Wreck It Ralph. So he had a, an amazingly great career uh, after leaving The Simpsons. But he was he was a brilliant director, and he had a great eye for you know look, making it look great, but also for making it so funny. Jim Reardon directs a lot of our our favorite episodes. We've talked. We he comes up a lot too uh, in conversation on the the commentary tracks as well. Uh, and what I really loved about speaking of the commentary tracks for this one, a lot was actually left in the cutting room floor on this one from deleted scenes and and things of that nature. One of which I really thought would have been great is there was a sequence where Bart, I believe, is riding his bike or no, he's skateboarding. Excuse me. He runs into Sherry and Terry who tell him his dad is going to kill him. Then he turns around, goes down another hallway, and it's his aunts telling him the exact same thing. Ah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's the difference between Dave, again, Dave Merkin and Al Jean and myself, is Al and I were always delivering the show way too short. We would always come in, we'd say, what is the absolute minimum length for a Simpsons episode? And Fox would say 20 minutes, and we'd go, well, this one's 17. <laughs> <laughs> Adventures of Ned Flanders time. <laughs> That's it. Every time it's great to pad it out, and we always use the full main title, and anything we could think of, 
Uh, but Merkin, he would deliver these 35 minute extravaganzas and wow. then he had to cut a lot. And it was always funny stuff. But it was it was just a strange attitude. Our whole careers, Al and I never delivered anything long enough. So uh, <laughs> or so our wives say. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, to wrap this one up a little bit, Homer basically discovers his lack of cable, his lack of beer. He seems to be handling it quite well. He just has to go talk to a version of Mo, who is, of course, not really there. It's the ghost bartender. Uh, he convinces Homer that to be happy, he needs to kill his family by saying, don't I look happy? La 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 la. I'm happy. See, now murder your family. <laughs> I like how he goes crazy in a matter of like a day, too. It's like three hours, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they barely got unpacked. They can. <laughs> the rest of the family can sense that Homer is losing it. And unfortunately, things become all too clear. I love that they find instead of the uh, uh, no TV and no beer make Homer go something something. First, it's just feeling fine. Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> but it does, in fact, make Homer go crazy. Yeah. Don't mind Don't if I do. mind if he does. <laughs> it is. Not, I mean, again, it's another gift of The Simpsons is that uh, when you say, oh, we're going to do The Simpsons uh, version of The Shining, for example, we already have one of everything. You know, they needed a caretaker and. They had Scatman Crothers. Oh, we got groundskeeper Willie. He's <laughs> the axe in the back. And they needed. A, they had a bartender. Hey, we have a bartender too. So that kind of thing makes our job easy and kind of fun. It's like, how do we plug in our show into this existing show? Whatever it is we're parodying. Well, having such a huge cast of characters, it's like you said, it's like you have the exact right Lego piece for any situation. There's a trick we do every once in a while on the show because we we keep a poster up and everybody has this poster of the 200 Simpsons characters all just kind of standing in a mob. And uh, every once in a while, I'll just walk up to the poster and I'll go, hey, this guy never met this guy, you know, and mm -hmm. it's pre it works, you know, every once in a while. Oh, look at that. Mo never met Maggie. And we got a whole great. <laughs> out of that so sometimes that's all it takes is what combination haven't we done that's funny just to think about all you need is essentially a meet cute for any of the random random simpsons characters yes there was a real <laughs> funny one out of the you know non sequitur out of the blue which i think the fans wound up hating where it was we just had a scene and the last two people in the scene were flanders and comic book guy and flanders says oh, i don't believe we've met i'm Ned flanders and Comic book guy says, I'm Jeff Robinson. And <laughs> it was just a weird, funny thing, but finally gave comic book guy a name and the fans were so mad. What why is he named Jeff Robinson? And I don't know. That was that was part of the joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I believe that's gone on to become one of the most popular questions in Simpsons Trivia Nights. I, I read that recently. I have no idea what the source was or how accurate they were in portraying it, but they had, were listing out the most common Simpsons trivia questions that get asked now, and that, I believe, was very close to the top, if not number one. Oh, boy. <laughs> so it's those little things that make a big impact. It's, again, you know... I, I'll bet we could not have functioned in the early days of the show if we knew... Everyone would be parsing it 25 years later. <laughs> but it's pretty good. I mean, one thing we like is not only people analyze it to death, but they get it right. You know, there's there's not a lot of misinformation floating around about The Simpsons. There's some weird conspiracy theories and that kind of thing. But, you know, the weirdest, tiniest bit of trivia uh, somehow got out there. It's probably from... Probably from our own DVD commentaries, but, <laughs> you know, you can trust the facts that are out there. And that's not true about most things, frankly, especially on the Internet. But I, uh, I find that most of the information we get from IMDb and things are typically, like you said, almost always exclusively drawn right from the DVD commentary. So from directly from the creator's mouth, most of the time yours or one of your colleagues. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great resource. They're, they're fun. For sure. 
You should, I don't know if it's come up. The reason we do these DVD commentaries, nobody gets paid, is they give us a really nice lunch. That's <laughs> that's how cheaply a Simpsons writer can get bought. Is they put out, you know, we get free lunch at work anyhow, but it's crap and. It's like if you want a good lunch, you've got to do a DVD commentary. <laughs> <laughs> so is there like a line of people trying to get in for those DVD commentaries then? People show up, we go, you got fired 18 years ago. What <laughs> <laughs> I haven't eaten since. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I'm shameless. I'll go there. I'll do a commentary on an episode I had nothing to do with. I bring my wife. I bring my cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow, we're still holding out for the uh, John Schwartzwelder episode to get a DVD car, or any any <laughs> any episode to have him on the commentary. Yes, I guess it's not going to happen. <laughs> not to plug the book, but that's what you're here for, brother. Get it, get those plugs in. <laughs> buy my book, buy my book. Uh, everything you want to know about John Schwartzwelder is in there, and I sort of demystify the man. He's just this great guy, and he's he's really amused that there's this mystery and mystique around him when he's just the guy who d doesn't like to leave his house so we'll do a shout out to our friends over at the secret transmission podcast where they explore all things strange and actually we join them to talk about simpsons conspiracies and the idea that he doesn't exist is one of the most popular ones i love that theory it's uh yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, like, he uh, actually made an appearance in the Homer at the Bat special last year, but he was played by Nick Offerman. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a picture of him actually in your book, which I was yeah. like, whoa, that's what the dude actually looks like. Because up <laughs> until that point, I'd only seen him as a Simpsons character. Yes, it's very, you know, again, because he's just my friend. He's just the guy I know. <laughs> I, I don't quite get this mystique around it. So, <laughs> so. You know, I had this picture. Oh, here's everybody at The Simpsons winning an Emmy. And they said, we've got to make this the last page of the book because people get to see John Swartzwelder. And it's like, okay. So there's Swartzwelder at the end of the book. Hey, that's enough reason right there, folks. Go ahead and get that pre-order in now at Amazon. Yes, or buy the Hebrew edition where the last page of the book is the first page. <laughs> there you go. Saves time. <laughs> yeah. Uh so this first segment wraps up when Bart uses his special connection he has with Groundskeeper Willie, the shitting. Not between four and five, though. That's true. That's <laughs> Willie's time. Uh, he <laughs> uses the shinning to make contact. Willie comes to the aid, though he ends up getting a knife. I'm sorry. He ends up getting an axe in his back for the troubles, and it won't be the first time that happens. But the luckily, last. Lisa, yeah, I said that wrong. It won't be the last time that happens. Uh, <laughs> luckily, however, Lisa has a portable TV or finds a portable TV and is able to distract her father. They all huddle around the warming glow of the television and Homer's urge to kill is falling, falling, fading, fading, rising. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I also love oh. that we introduce this little song that comes on as they talk about the Tony Awards coming on the air. We start to hear a song that we'll call back at the very end of the episode. One uh, chorus line dancing. What is it? I lost it already. Yeah, I forget. One chorus line of people. That's what it is. Yes. One chorus line of people. <laughs> that's oh. a Merkin Hates musical. There's... A really funny story, a couple of years later, Merkin did a clip show uh, where I think the premise was, I, for, I forget where it goes, but the, it starts off with everybody's watching the movie Paint Your Wagon. Oh, I love that one. <laughs> yeah. There's a room full of guys writing this episode about Paint Your Wagon and making fun of Paint Your Wagon, and I just walked in. I, I was just visiting, and I find out, none of them has ever bothered to watch paint your wagon <laughs> and they said what's it about and i you know i like the movie i start telling them the plot and they're going that's paint your wagon they couldn't believe it so he he loves the dump on musicals well you know since you brought up musicals <laughs> one thing that we have talked about on this show you actually brought up in your book and unfortunately it was a bit of a heartbreaker for me personally you talk about the play, it's the um, 
the variation of Cape Fear, where it's like a postmodern or post-apocalyptic. Only thing they have in common is remembering the episode of The Simpsons, Cape Fear. Yeah. Electric, uh, Springfield Electric, I can't remember what it's called, but regardless, it's not worth seeing, apparently, because it's not by Simpsons fans, and that absolutely kills me. We actually talked about that play with uh, your colleague Carolyn Omine when she came on to review that episode with us, and we, at the time, were very excited by the idea of this, and it sounds like uh, we should maybe just go see I Hate Musicals the Musical instead. Well, that's another great plug for a play. Everyone come out and see my play. I hate musicals, the musical. <laughs> uh, get in your time machine because it closed eight months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Real quick, there was this, this, music, this play called Mr. Burns, a post-electric musical, I think. And it was a, a post-apocalyptic theatrical version of the Cape Fear episode. And... We loved the premise, even though, you know, it was just an, an unknown playwright sort of took our episode and stretched it into a musical and that kind of thing. We loved the idea of this thing. And I think three of us flew across country, flew in from L.A. to New York to see this play. And it's dreadful. It sucks. And it's, you know, it's clearly someone who doesn't get The Simpsons at all. I even got this feeling the, the playwright doesn't like The Simpsons. And so she she very freely kind of appropriated an, an awful lot of our uh, our script and didn't give anyone credit and then just made it grim and pretentious and dull. And it was, so, of course, so grim and pretentious and dull that all the New York theater critics loved it. Oh, my <laughs> God. I loved this play so much. And I thought, am I crazy? And then... The play went to London where it would get booed every night. People couldn't sit. Someone, one critic called it three hours in hell. So wow. that was it. It was, you know, and, and again, it's still a great premise. I think somebody should should do this musical comedy as a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> that would make more sense, I would think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was truly, truly bummed to read that whenever, when you talk about that in the book, it actually broke my heart a little bit, because I thought that, like you, sounded like a great premise. I just wish it would have been done by somebody who was actually a fan of the show. Yes, and there have been a couple of, you know, there there was a musical review that went all over New York of just a night of songs from The Simpsons, and again, complete copyright infringement, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But again, we would all people, uh, writers would fly in from L.A. to go see the show in New York. And it was delightful. It was called We Put the Spring in Springfield. And it was done with such oh, love. I love that song on the they, show. They chose the song so well and did them with so much brio that that's a great show. We don't mind when we're getting ripped off in a good way. That's why we like Family Guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, zing. Wow. Zinger. Zinger. Holy cow. Shots fired. <laughs> Family Guy <laughs> podcast out there. Yeah, wherever you're at. That's holding your knee for 15 minutes. <laughs> I love Family Guy, too. There's a nice tribute to the show. It's it's the one animated show I really love. I actually saw McHomer about 15 years ago with my father, where it was a one-man show of Macbeth done with Simpson voices. And it was absolutely hilarious for us, at least. We got a real kick out of hearing Homer as Macbeth. So, that I mean, but it was done as from a comedy standpoint from the get-go for obvious reasons. So it, it makes sense when you take a comedy show and do something comedic with it. So I don't understand why somebody wouldn't get that when they're doing something based on The Simpsons. Yes, and even our Simpsons cast went to a special production of McHomer. They all love that, too. So. Yeah, we're pretty, we, you know, we love to be appropriated. We love, I love <laughs> seeing Simpsons turn up in, you know, South Park, especially, something like that. <laughs> to see us pop up in pop culture, it's great for us. This just, this thing, this one play was just a real uh, damp squib. Wasn't so great. You may be able to shine some light on this story, but we actually heard the, the Simpsons cat, I'm sorry, the Simpsons writers, you would be one of them, sent flowers to Matt and Trey after the episode Simpsons did it uh, several years ago. Oh, I don't know. I, I'm, uh, I'm sure that's true. <laughs> <laughs> we, always, uh, we always appreciate that concept because we love both shows, obviously. There's, there's great humor in both. 
We do have a couple more segments to talk about on this episode yes, of The Simpsons. Show. Let's get moving, dude. I, I want to do what I've always done and deliver a short show. So let's keep <laughs> <laughs> We are going to talk about Time and Punishment, our second segment, which is a parody of the Ray Bradbury story, A Sound of Thunder from 1989, which I'm actually really excited HBO is recreating uh, Fahrenheit uh, 454, what is it? 451. 451, there it is. It's the book burning one. I love that story when I was a kid. I'm really excited to see what HBO is going to bring to the picture. Mm Mm-hmm. That'll actually yeah. already be out by the time this airs, so hopefully it's good. Watch well, it now, after helpful. you read Mike's book. <laughs> Perfect. And this one, it's another classic that I think many people are well familiar with, in which Homer manages to stick his hand in a toaster, and through some home repairs that he does on his own after smashing it to bits, he somehow creates a time traveling device and ends up in the land of the dinosaurs fortunately his dad gave him some very sound advice way back on his wedding day (laughs) if you're ever trapped back in time don't step on anything (laughs) it's classic (laughs) advice good job dad even the tiniest thing can make changes you could never imagine (laughs) And of course, that's exactly what happens because it's Homer. Ew, bug, squishy, you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's only natural. That's true. If a giant prehistoric bug flew in my face, I probably would thing. swat by instinct. That's that isn't just Homer. I think that's just human. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and didn't he have a run in with a toaster in a previous Treehouse of Horror 2 with the Krusty the Clown doll trying to <laughs> kill him? Saying, and the toaster's giving me funny looks or whatever he said. Oh, yes. Yes, it did. Toaster's <laughs> Funny word, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. You know, it's a, you see it in a lot of New Yorker cartoons, a toaster. And it's one of the weirdest things in your house because it only does one thing. <laughs> We've given it that name. It's the toaster. Don't try to do anything else with it. Every, you know, your stove does 50 things. A microwave works on anything. A toaster just makes toast. I'm trying this out for the improv. How do you like it? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I got another hour of toaster material. That's my one-man show. <laughs> Toasted. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, we get back, and unfortunately for Homer, probably the worst person on the planet who could take over the planet takes over the planet, and that's Ned Flanders. And immediately when Homer is freaked out by this, he has to go back for re netification this actually, if anything, reminds me of the Apple com- uh, the Apple computer commercial that was really big in the late 80s, early 90s, where you had this dystopian future. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's ripped from many other works of uh, fiction, but it's what it reminded me of was actually that Apple commercial. Made me laugh. Yeah, it, was a cla- it, it was very much what we had in mind for that. It's, that was, it was a 1984 commercial. It was, based, it was from the year 1984, and... Uh, based on the book 1984 and the famous commercial was directed by Ridley Scott. Oh, wow. So, oh. Yeah. Is it, oh, good. You learned something today. Hey, Why? Yeah. yeah. Why, Wait, I, we're not trying to educate people on this program. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, this, this whole second segment is, is like the first segment where one reason it's great is we started with great source material. I think <clears throat> that Ray Bradbury story is one of the all time great short stories ever and it's been remade so many times and so many ways and it's just so versatile and then just to be able to plug homer into it and have everything go wrong in a homery way was really really funny i i gotta say that one especially uh the the second one is is what it's got to be one of my two or three very favorite uh uh treehouse segments it's just so clever. It's relentlessly clever. And the, the Ned Flanders thing is so dark, you know, a future run by Ned Flanders. You wouldn't think is that bad, but he's, he's cutting up people's brains and that kind of thing. <laughs> well, it's not it so bad. It's not oakley <laughs> <laughs> They just pull out the chunk they cut out right through your nose. It's yeah. bliss. <laughs> it's so dark and weird. And it's, uh, what is it? Bart and Lisa are holding... 
jars with chunks of their brains floating in it. It's it's super weird. And, you know, and that's just, I mean, it's got to be maybe 45 seconds of the episode. I mean, that's the thing about these Halloween shows is you can, you can have a whole lot happen. And, you know, things that, you know, big mind-blowing things you could make a movie out of or just, well, we spent a minute on it. Let's go move. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah, they are very quick, but actually I think the Netification Center was maybe the longest segment of this specific little series because they go really fast after this. It it goes to a giant world where Homer's tiny and the kids want to squash the bug that looks like their father. Uh, yeah. th- my personal favorite is where everything is absolutely perfect. His family is actually nice. They live in a wealthy home. Uh, he's got a brand new car in the driveway. His sister-in-laws are dead. Everything is going well, <laughs> except there's no donuts. And if he would have just waited a minute or even a couple of seconds longer without fleeing at the thought of living in a donut-free world, it's starts raining donuts so this was literally homer's heaven and he was seconds away from eternal bliss that's yep. that's even darker in my opinion <laughs> that's a dave merkins says that breaks his heart even though you know he helped create it he said it's just so sad homer abandons this world where it rains donuts <laughs> my favorite thing this is the stupid kind of thing that only a, a writer on the show appreciates it's uh, is in that that whatever one minute chunk is the Simpsons are really rich and prosperous and their corn cob curtains in the background are blue. It's like this is this is how wealthy they are. They have blue corn cob curtains. <laughs> I don't know what it means. It was just such a funny little background touch, and it just shows you, you know, we put a, have to put a lot of thought into everything, including uh, you know, in the ideal world. What kind of curtains do they have? You're absolutely well, right. I did not even did not even think about well, that, but your attention to detail is impressive. Yeah, I want that. I'll say one reason I wanted to cover a treehouse episode is just what makes them unique is they are backbreakingly hard to do. Uh, by the nature of The Simpsons, it's usually like episode four of the year, but with you know the first three episodes are holdovers from the year before, so. Uh, year after year, the Halloween show is the first episode we do, you know, that we write and produce every year. And it burns everyone out. We st- we start off the year at maximum burnout. They're <laughs> really, really hard to write because they're so dense. Uh, but they're much, much harder to animate because, uh, you know, you do an episode like, uh, well, even let's say you write a scene where you just say the Simpsons are at a costume party. Well, it's, you know, that's just one sentence, but then you got to figure out who's at the party and what costume is everyone wearing? And then you got to design those costumes. Then you got to get legal clearance. Is it okay for Homer to dress like Deadpool or is that trademarked up? And you do another segment. Oh, here they are. It's the Simpsons in the 19th century. Okay. What does Marge wear in the 19th century? What do they wear? What is their house? Like everything's, Every, you know, couple of minutes, you've got to redesign everything in the Simpsons world. So it's very, very hard work, hard for the writers, but brutally hard for the animators. And they also get a little competitive. There's the weight of history, uh, these, you know, flamboyantly directed uh, tree houses of the past that they're, they've got to compete with. It's like every year you're setting the bar higher and higher and it just gets insane so that means you have to create even more insane pieces that still somehow fit in the simpsons world yes and it gets it's gotten extremely hard it was a couple of years ago where uh i think you know we'd run out of horror movies to parody there was nothing left to parody so they did like a parody of the diving bell and the butterfly which is an art house movie about a writer who's paralyzed it's like what we we have no horror left in the world. We use it all up. <laughs> well, this episode does move on with a few other very quick flashes to alternative worlds that Homer has created. Uh, I do really love the part where he accidentally sits on the fish, though. He's like, oh, I wish, I wish I didn't squish that fish. That's just <laughs> such a great bit of dialogue. Uh, <laughs> 
we we also get our cameo by Kang and Kodos, who are laughing at the silly human's inability to handle time travel uh, until they actually get turned into Mr. Peabody and Sherman from the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. Yep. It's Which great, just a- great. And again, it's a, it's a real Merkin thing just to, I'm sure he got no clearance for that. We just appropriated those characters. <laughs> And it's like, all right, let him sue. Because in the past, like, we had the Flintstones in an episode, and we had to pay them as guest cast. We had to pay $400 to Fred Flintstone to use him on The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> Did you actually write a check to Fred Flintstone at that point? How does that even work? <laughs> I never saw the check, but I know we paid them as guest cast. We paid... We paid them the same thing. We paid Stephen Hawking. (laughs) Stephen Hawking got the same amount of money to do The Simpsons. That's too funny. Oh, well, I like that we got another voiceover from James Earl Jones in this one. So I it's just I believe it'd be the first time since he did The Raven back in the first Treehouse of Horror. That's right. Yeah, that was a really the whole thing, you know. And and again, I had very little to do with this episode, but it was uh, Merkin just peppered it with really fun stuff. And I love something we, I don't think we've done on other uh, Treehouse of Horrors where he has all these running jokes going through it from segment to segment. Like Willie getting the ax in the back again. Yeah. <laughs> You're not in your world, Homer. I'll tell you how to get back. Thwack. <laughs> yep. It's really great. It is really good. great episode. That's why we're here. And Homer does eventually find himself back in his own world with his perfectly normal family where donuts are plentiful and the sky is blue and Friday is TGIF night on ABC and everything's (laughs) just fine until they go to eat. And we do, in fact, see they slurp their dinner with lizard tongues. But Homer's like, eh, close enough. Close enough. (laughs) (laughs) And we're good to go. Yeah. We come back and start up our final segment nightmare cafeteria which is a parody of Wes craven's very short-lived program nightmare cafe and this is also the very first writing assignment after he was hired by the simpsons for one david cohen who on page 54 if that's the same number as the pre-releases it will be in the additional release but somewhere in the book springfield confidential one mike reese actually says David Cohen might be the best Simpsons writer ever. Yeah, he blows me away. I think he's just fantastic. And (laughs) although I don't really like this segment, um, (laughs) I like everything else he did. And of course, you know, he wrote, you know, 636 episodes, I think, have aired so far, probably 640 by the time this airs. And still, there's, there's such consensus that uh, his Itchy and Scratchy and Poochie episode is just everybody's favorite show. They <laughs> love that. So he wrote that. He wrote my favorite episode, which is the one, I don't even know what it's called, where Lisa finds the bones of an angel. Uh, oh, so at could, the mall? <laughs> yeah. I just love And that was a show. That's it's a really funny. Good one. I worked on a- almost every episode of The Simpsons, but I didn't work on that one. So I actually just went home and got to watch it. Like, Everybody else gets to watch The Simpsons, and I'm watching it, and I didn't know how it ended. It was a mystery, and it ended, and I go, wow, the show is really great when I don't work on it. <laughs> so that's it. I love that show. And then, you know, and he did a really sweet one where Bart, I think, smashes, a, he kills a robin or something and nurses the egg. So David could just write everything. He could write sci-fi, and he could write really heartfelt emotion and then he would do that on uh futurama too which is probably maybe the one of the greatest creations by a simpsons alumnus uh, yeah we're also big fans of futurama and it's it makes so much sense that i believe he's actually a scientist as and he works on futurama i mean that's just a perfect fit as a writer with that background yeah lisa the skeptic i knew i'd remember it lisa sorry the- Great episode. Just For sure. So, so smart. I mean, that's it. Smart permeates everything he does, but still funny. He's just a very funny guy. I met him 
he was uh, president of the Harvard Lampoon like uh, six or seven years after me. So just a super talented guy. Very cool. Uh, the Nightmare Cafeteria segment does actually start off with Springfield Elementary School having a overpopulation problem in their detention hall. There are just way too many kids <laughs> running amok, so it's just becoming a problem. Simultaneously, the lunchroom is also having a problem. They just cannot make very good food out of this grade F meat that they are provided. <laughs> <laughs> Does it say mostly circus animals? <laughs> yeah, Some filler. True. Yeah. You know, that actually, uh, from the commentary, it was a friend of one of the writers, and I can't remember who it was, but this came from a real life story. Somebody was walk walking across their college campus, and they happened to be seeing the food delivery as it was happening, and they remember seeing on the side of the box, I think it was actually grade C, in very bold letters said, Approve for human consumption. <laughs> <laughs> Which, to be fair, is better than the alternative, but not necessarily <laughs> something that comforts you when you're going to the mess hall later that afternoon. That's right. That's why. <laughs> All it takes, though, is for Bully Jimbo to be pulling an antic where he trips somebody and ends up getting sauce spilled on top of him. And it makes Skinner have an idea that maybe there is a solution after all that could help both him with his detention problem and Doris with her lack of good meat problem. So we see... Fight me, Skinner. <laughs> oh, maybe I will be. <laughs> <laughs> I like how it was Jimbo's favorite outfit. Out of all the outfits he wears, that was his favorite one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Immediately the kids realize that Jimbo's missing, and, I mean, they were supposed to be beaten up for their lunch money hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> we, we see that Uter just cannot resist the new cafeteria food, and he actually cuts in line. Mm-mm, tsk, tsk. Mm -hmm. So he's going to detention for that, and wouldn't you know, the next day, they're having Uterbraten for lunch. What could I love it. Uterbraten. <laughs> It's just great Simpsons logic that because they're eating a German kid, it has to be German food day at the Simpsons. <laughs> school, everyone's wearing lederhosen and that kind of thing. It's, I don't know what it is. It's, they can't, I mean, the joke, which they may even do too much in this segment, is people blurting out the truth and then <laughs> taking it back. Not inconspicuous at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're actually going to do another segment here that got cut, but another bit they were planning on doing was one day it was going to be serving Terry Yaki steak with sherry sauce. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Really yeah. great. Oh. Good stuff. Okay. Good stuff right there. That's it. The kids, of course, go to their parents for help, as one might do when they are being eaten by their school staff. Uh, they go to their mother, specifically Marge, who's doing laundry, and she's had enough of having to solve her kids' problems. So she's like, you're going to march to that school, and you're going to tell them not to eat you. <laughs> I, I, I mean, they're 8 and so 10. Much. They should solve their own problems for now. <laughs> So there is actually a deleted scene right here that also sounded really funny where Homer was supposed to talk to the kids as well. And essentially, Homer, during this conversation, would say, mmm, children. Lisa would point <laughs> out that Homer, even Homer, doesn't eat children. That's even below him. Uh, though he did start to point out, he's like, of course I would never eat children. There are laws against that sort of thing. But there aren't laws that say I can't research what it would be like to cook Millhouse or, you know, different ways that I could prepare Millhouse. And there's nothing that says I can't write a book about different ideas of how to cook Millhouse. And that was actually going to lead up to the transition where we see Edna Krabappel reading the joys of cooking Millhouse in the next scene. Really? Well, you know, that's a very deletable scene. <laughs> the only <laughs> reason that it's kind of awkward that it got cut is this segment now doesn't feature Homer at all because that was his only scene that he was uh -oh. actually written in. Yes, that is true. But you got to admit, the first two segments of this, uh, this treehouse are pure Homer. It's nothing but Homer being a jackass and scene <laughs> 
scene after scene. So it's yep. nice to have a little Homer relief at the end there. <laughs> you know, it's absolutely true. He, he was very much uh, heavily featured in two thirds of the episode, but you still what do you have mean heavily. <laughs> you still have to uh, admit, though, having one of the most popular characters not admit ad- or not appear at all in the segment is noticeable. But again, you're absolutely right. There's enough of him to go around. There's enough of Homer. I mean, it's a little Homer overkill in that you have him scream. He goes crazy in the first segment because he's got no beer. And then he goes crazy and screams in the second segment because there's no donuts. It's sort of, okay, let's not do another segment of this. <laughs> Change of pace time. That's it. Let's have someone else scream about something else. <laughs> The Springfield Elementary population has decreased significantly. We're down to just a few kids, but it's groundskeeper Willie to the rescue. He's here to save the day. Until he once again ends up with another axe in his back, this time courtesy of Principal Skinner, who has now just gone full-fledged psycho and is completely fine with murdering and eating essentially everyone. You know, some haggis. (laughs) You're leaving out my favorite joke in this segment, which is they're killing and eating all the students. And then you cut back to this classroom and there's only three kids in it. And Mrs. Krabappel's fat, (laughs) noticeably fatter. And I don't think anyone comments on it or anything, but it's just clear. You go, oh, she's eating so many kids. She's gotten really fat. (laughs) It's a good visual gag for sure. Uh, yeah. But it says something for Lunch Lady Doris. Uh, given given the right material, she can apparently make a fairly tasty meal. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and I think they they possibly could have cut that Homer scene out earlier too, because they got mad at him for eating children when all the children have been eating the school lunches every day after up until a certain point. There's a scene where Bart's eating the sandwich, I think the day after Jimbo was killed. So you can't really get mad at Homer for eating children when the children were eating them as well, I think. Yes. It's whatever the rules of cannibalism are. I don't know if it's worth jumping ahead, whatever, 25 years to where we went even farther. It was uh, was Joel Cohen's idea to have this episode, which I guess was even just last year where Homer is eating himself. Yeah, uh, yeah, I remember that one. And that was it. I mean, because I think up to this point, this nightmare cafeteria is the most disturbing thing we ever did on The Simpsons. And then we up the ante, of, you know, a couple of decades later, we said, gee, oh, here's a way to make it even sicker to have Homer eating himself. And I don't know how the, and we were going, we laughed so hard watching that show. You know, we we watch the show as a group, uh, you know, and it's our job. And so sometimes it makes us laugh. Sometimes it's like, what do we got to fix? But, oh, my God, we so got such a kick out of watching there just be less and less Homer in every scene as he's eating himself. But we go, we don't know what the reaction of the public was to that. because It's so dark. Uh, what did you guys think? That was my favorite segment of the recent Treehouse of Horror, but I have a dark, sick sense of humor, so it kind of fits. <laughs> yeah, I I am a poor person that had to recently cancel all of my cable subscriptions months and months ago, oh. and I will admit to you, the, um, I occasionally get my internet to let me watch a recent episode of The Simpsons. I got kind of screwed with the Ha Ha Land on FXX on the app where I only got to see the last few minutes of it. But the last one I got to see in full length was honestly the, the game of Thrones parody. Ah. And I, I laughed a lot at that, but it's been very upsetting because the Simpsons is something I hold near and dear to my heart, especially with um, the loss of my father a little over a year ago, the Simpsons was kind of our thing and everything I ever did Simpsons related was because of him. So it's another reason I love doing this podcast is because there's, there's episodes that I've missed over the years and I'm very sad about it, but it's, I, I like the fact that we get to go back and we're going to get to see them with fresh eyes and open minds, which is, I think, the most important part in this internet age is people just jump to conclusions without watching things. And we want to be different from that. And I think it's going to pay off when we hope we get to season 29 and, and soon 30. But uh, that's the dream. The goal is to catch up and this will become a we review it as you make them sort of podcast. That would be so much fun. <laughs> 
Yeah. It certainly, uh, you know, I know where we're all dancing around. People love to say, oh, The Simpsons is not what it was and that kind of thing. And I'm a guy, you know, I ran the show in season four. And I remember reading in People magazine, people saying, The Simpsons is not what it used to be. So they were <laughs> in season four as going downhill. And now, you uh. know, and then a few decades later, they say, oh, this was the greatest season of The Simpsons ever. And it's like, well, great, you know. You ruined my year, but okay. Glad, glad you changed your mind. So I'm hoping this this kind of revisionism will come in when people sit in and watch the show. I'll just say the other day we were at work and we saw an episode that's probably going to air in six months, and it's uh, I won't give away any of the plot except it's about a whole uh, about Grandpa and his wartime experience. And I was just watching it, going, "Well, this is another classic. This is." This is easily, you know, people can say this is here we are in season 30. And I swear this show is as good as any of the best shows we ever did on the show. And it's a great story. You won't see where it's going. And it's put together beautifully. And it's got a good message. It's actually heartfelt. It's a it's a really great episode by Mike Price. So just hey, wait. We love Mike hey. Price. I'm Mike Price. So you'll see. We're still making great episodes. We still can we still can knock them out of the park every once in a while. I watch almost every week on the new episodes, and I think this last season has been absolutely killing it. I just watched the one where they had to uh, oh where did they have to go this last Sunday to get a free health care. It was a brilliant oh. episode. Fantastic! Yeah, they went to Denmark. That's and, right. Uh, yeah, it's, you know it's not a story <laughs> you would do in season two or season three. But we got him to Denmark, and you know we love doing something like that where we go. All the jokes about Denmark are ours. You know, nobody, <laughs> no sitcom has gone to Denmark. <laughs> Stake and claim. Glad you like that. That's a really good show. Absolutely. You know, since you brought him up, I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit and ask if uh, you've gotten a chance to watch Mike Price's new show, F is for Family. No, I'm like your partner there. I don't have Netflix. I just. I have, I just have whatever Amazon shows. I don't even, I don't have cable. I don't get broadcast TV. So no, I've never seen it. I'm, it's great, isn't it? It is fantastic. It's fantastic. It really fantastic. Is. Yeah. I steal Miles' Netflix information so I can actually have Netflix. <laughs> yeah, I'll, right. I'll email you after the show, Mike. We'll, we'll take care of it so you can tune in. <laughs> hey, that'd be great. No one tag Netflix here. <laughs> <laughs> You're just confessing to a crime. Uh, this is all parody. I'm playing a character. <laughs> That is pretty much the end of this story, except that Bart wakes up from the dream as he's falling into the giant blender that they've been grinding uh, up these children in. And they get glass in that millhouse meat, which, ew, who wants uh, glass yeah, in that Yeah, it's true. Ugh, disgusting. <laughs> I just got the joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was all just a dream, though, as we already talked about earlier. It was Bart sleeping and having a nightmare, and nothing bad could ever really happen. They're in the safety of their home, except for that fog that turns people inside out that we already talked about. That was actually a parody of The Dark, a 1962 radio program by Arch Obler that I'm not what? familiar with, but I imagine that's a great media to tell the story of the killer <laughs> fog that turns you inside out. I could imagine laying down in a dark room listening to that on a radio and being terrified of every airspace. Yeah. I wonder what what it even seemed like hearing it on the radio. We turned inside out. It's I don't know. It's really weird. <laughs> it's a strange thing, and it's such a good job of being animated for something so disgusting. Because it, there used to be a, a thing, a little short segment they did in between shows on Nickelodeon when I was a kid called Inside Out Boy, and they did it with Claymation, and it was a similar concept. He uh, this kid swang over or was on the swing set swang that's not the right word he was swinging and he actually went all the way over the top bar this caused his body to be turned inside out and he had to deal with the struggles of adolescence while also having his inner organs exposed uh, i immediately thought of that in both ways that was animated it's just amazing to me that they can take something so disgusting and make it look really good on television 
Oh, great. Yeah, it, it's a great looking end segment. And again, it's a Dave Merkin show, which means there's no closing credits. We have to see this whole musical number under credits just to fit it into the show. And it's, <laughs> it's super disgusting and very funny and good satire, obviously, because that's the only way. It's a parody of a chorus line. And the only way I could sit through a chorus line is if the whole cast turned inside out. <laughs> Well, I like how they even do a good job of letting you know that it's Willie is the guy that jumps in to sing halfway through the song as well, considering like he looks just the same as Homer almost because he's inside out. But yep. because of the accent, like they do a good job of differentiating. Yeah, it's jokes right to the end. It's an amazing episode. I'm glad I didn't have to come in and talk about some real stinker. <laughs> <laughs> It was a great episode. We had a lot of fun reviewing it with you. Mike, is there anything else that you want to add or say about Treehouse of Horror 5? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't know if I've mentioned yet, but I have a book coming up. <laughs> oh, oh Please, really? Yeah, do tell. <laughs> yes. No, I, I just, I love Treehouse 5. I got to say Treehouse 6, which, you know, you'll be doing in about six months. Uh, that's my favorite episode ever because every... Every Treehouse of Horror up to that point has two dynamite segments and one segment that's just okay. And, you know, not to disparage Nightmare Cafeteria, which is funny and intricate and that kind of thing, but it's not as good as the Shinning and the Toaster one. And it isn't until the next year uh, with, uh, with Treehouse 6 where it was three great segments. And uh, that, that was the first time we did it. Usually... And we know it. I mean, I got to say, I put together two, two Treehouse episodes, and eh, one was always sucky, and it, it happened to be the one I wrote, and we'd stick it in the middle and hope nobody notices. <laughs> so this one is probably, Treehouse, of five, Treehouse 5 probably is the most consistent one to date. And then Treehouse 6, I think, knocks it out of the park. That's the one that's got 3D Homer in it. Oh, and, yeah. The 50 foot eyesores and a Nightmare on Elm Street parody. Yes. The Nightmare on Elm Street really parody is actually my personal favorite parody that you guys done. But I, I'm a huge Simpsons fan and a huge Freddy Krueger fan. So, they, you know, Willie in that role is absolutely perfect. Yeah. Again, it's just that it works out really well. And again, it all it's always great when you start with great source material, which, which Freddy Krueger is. For sure. Uh, Richie, real quick, was there anything that you or that book of yours wanted to point out about Treehouse of Horror 5? My guidebook, The Simpsons, The Complete Guide to Our Favorite Family, pretty much mentioned everything that we got through. There's a, a few facts that are boring we don't need to go over. But I just wanted to say in general, Mike, thank you again so much for letting us be a part of your book release. Oh, I don't yeah. I don't read very often, and, and the <laughs> highest praise I can give you is that there's one room that I do all my reading in, in in my apartment, but your book got me to take that book outside of that room to keep reading it. So <laughs> I don't know what more praise I can give you for that, and I just wanted to say in, in regards to the book itself, The World Travels, Miles hinted at it earlier, I loved reading your reception by other groups of people throughout the entire world when you're talking in front of them, even the Qatar part where you told your joke in there, that was just... I just got such a kick out of hearing people in other countries say, oh, we that's how all Americans are, or that's how my dad is here in this country, and <laughs> people all over can grow attached to it. And I think that that speaks to why you guys have been on the air for so long, is that everybody gets joy out of watching it. And even the people that, that talk smack without watching it, you know that they still watch certain times, and they probably laugh a lot more than they're willing to admit. So thank you for everything you guys do. Thank you. That's really nice. I got to say, and I don't, you know, People have a gripe. It's a legitimate thing to say, oh, it's not what it used to be, or this was a bad episode. When I go anywhere else in the world, I've never heard anyone say that. They don't question <laughs> it. I think it's nice that they just appreciate it. Hey, look, here's a gift we're giving. We worked really hard. Uh, we tried to make it as funny as we could, and then we're throwing it into your house free every week. So they seem to get that, and uh, we appreciate it. But we we. We're glad, you know, here we are all still talking about the show after 30 years. So it couldn't be more gratifying. Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was an honor getting to talk with 
one of the, as you said, well, you, you accounted for 13. We're saying you're number 14. One of the 14 approximately people that created The Simpsons, which is just incredible to even think about. Uh, such an honor to have you on the show and to hear your insight and be able to discuss one of these great episodes uh, with you. And we're so excited about your book release. We hope it absolutely knocks it out of the park. Remember, Amazon.com pre-order Springfield Confidential joke secrets and outright lies from a lifetime writing for the simpsons uh absolutely fantastic read and again we just cannot thank you enough for joining us here today pleasure thank you thanks for having me absolutely that is gonna do it for this week's best darn diddly review show remember follow our show at best darn diddly you can follow the whiz kid at the whiz underscore kid 23 and i am at mr most days off that's gonna work pretty much everywhere we thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode the whiz kid and i will be back again next week to discuss bart's girlfriend and until that next episode Bite me, Skinner. I mean, Miles. <laughs> and until next time, be cromulent to each other. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> One. One chorus line of people dance until they make us stop. Two many dancing people covered with blood, gore, and glop. Just. One sniff, sniff of that, that fog, fog and you're inside out. It's worse, it's worse than, than that flesh-eating virus that you've read about. Vital organs, they are what we're dressed in. The family dog is I am Bart's intestine. Best darn diddle.